happened. Stop asking about it. She didn't have anything to do with it. She wasn't there that morning. She voluntarily cooperated with law enforcement. She provided us all the information. I'm not going to tell you where she's at. Stop. Leave me alone. That the family made the choice, whether you believe it's the correct one or not, to not pursue say If it were me, I don't know how that would sit with me knowing that she didn't know the full story. And that might very well have changed the position she took, what she advocated for at the time. All I can tell you is what I might do. It would definitely have changed the calculus for me. A couple of years ago, I posted an episode of Dr. Phil's podcast, The Devil Beside Me, which is the Chris Watts and Janan Watts story, the Watts family murders story. And when I posted this episode, I called it something like the hidden episode, the missing episode, the deleted episode, and let me, almost a year, but I couldn't be sure about that. Episode three reappeared in his podcast series. Now, no one can know why this episode was pulled temporarily from Dr. Phil's menu of podcast selections. Chris and Chan Ann Watts, well, it wasn't over in fact, it was just starting to unfold. And I have a sneaking suspicion that made some people really nervous. If you listen to the entire episode, which appears on my channel, and I included a link in the description box, it becomes pretty clear, to me at least, and I'd like to know what you think, that it is very possible the reason that episode was deleted was because Dr. Phil implicates Nicole Kessinger as being a possible accomplice in the horrible crime that Chris Watts committed, or at least he implicates her as having something to do with it. But there's even more to it than that. Now, I should mention that the timing of the recording of episode three of The Double Beside Me is very important. This episode was recorded between the time Chris Watts was sentenced in November of 2018 and the time when Chris Watts gave his infamous jailhouse interview in February of 2019. That's just a few months span, and the episode was recorded during that time, and it was produced and published right around the time of Chris Watts' jailhouse recording. Now, that's very important because at the time that Dr. Phil remained, did Chris's mistress, Nicole, know more about his marital situation than she had let on? Did she have any idea that Chris would soon end the lives of the people who loved him the most? Dr. Phil is asking questions that are all but forbidden to ask by anybody who is close to law enforcement or says that they have an inside scoop on the case. Now, remember the timing of the recording of episode three. Now, Chris and Nicole met at work and sparks flew. They soon began an affair, but according to Nicole, she was not aware that this was an affair or that she was the mistress, that she was the other woman. She says she thought she was dating a guy who was in the midst of a mostly amicable divorce. Dr. Phil goes on to talk about anybody who has a brain would be looking up information about the person that they were about to start dating. After all, the internet is a thing and information about just about anyone is readily available. And as many of you know, Nicole Kessinger was a prolific internet searcher. In fact, she searched Chris Watts' name and Shanann Watts' names nine or 10 months before she and Chris Watts claimed that they started dating or that they even met. While some people believe that those internet searches aren't real because some representative of the district attorney's office told somebody who inquired that those dates were a typo, District Attorney Rourke later confirmed that those internet searches that appeared in the discovery were in fact a result of the investigator's research. They were legitimate. I made a video about that too. You can find it in the Nicole Kessinger playlist or on its own. The link for that video, again, is in the description box. There are many other interesting facts regarding what Shanann posted on social media and what was going on with Chris and Nicole Kessinger. This includes the fact that Shanann Watts started posting about her pregnancy June 9th, 2017. 
She posted about her pregnancy on June 10th, 11th, and 12th. The first email communication between Chris Watts and Nicole Kessinger happens on when? June 12th. Again, Shanann posted about her pregnancy for the first time on June 9th. And the first communication between Chris Watts and Nicole Kessinger is on June 12th. 2018, in fact, on June 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th, 2018, on each of those days, there was a video posted to Facebook about Shanann's pregnancy. She was very excited. The video that shows Shanann telling Chris Watts about the pregnancy was posted on June 11th, 2018. We did it. <laughs> I like that shirt. Just the chest. That's awesome. Guess, uh, guess, guess when you want to, it happens. Guess what, girls? Guess what? Guess what? Guess what? Easy. There's a baby in mommy's belly. Well, your buddy. It's in mommy's belly, you silly. She's in my belly. We go for our first ultrasound at three-ish, 3.15. Hey, Bella, how many babies do I have in my belly? Five. Whoa. Whoa, 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 whoa. That's a lot of babies. It certainly is a coincidence that the first time Shanann posted about her pregnancy was on, on June 9th. Then again, on the 10th, 11th, and 12th. And the first communication between Chris Watts and Nicole Kessinger is on June 12th. In its discovery, the supervisor in Indarco that reported these emails said that these were the only email exchanges he could find between Kessinger and Chris Watts. So on the 12th, Nicole Kessinger kind of nudges Chris Watts through email by addressing his entire team with this email. Kessinger says, gentlemen, I spoke with my gas monitor vendor regarding your app access. Our account has been reset. Please continue to use the same credentials you were provided upon receiving your unit. Let me know if you continue to have issues or require anything further. Best regards, Nikki Kessinger. There are a total of six emails between Kessinger and Watts, and it is only on this day did the supervisor Anna Darko find any email exchanges between the two. Nicole Kessinger says, Chris, thank you for being honest with me this morning. Truthfulness is so underrated in our culture. Saludos cordiales, Nikki. You have to wonder what she's referring to. What was he being truthful about on June 12, 2018? Let's go back to Dr. Phil to hear the final thing I want to focus on in this video from that season three episode of The Devil Beside Me. Once news of Shannon's disappearance spread, Nicole had gone to police of her own free will to speak to them about her involvement with Chris. But was she a hero in this story? Or is it possible, like Shannon's parents believe to this day, that she tried to help Chris? And when it all started coming unraveled, when it all started hitting the wall, she got scared and bailed. Was she actually helping him and got cold feet and decided, save yourself, girl? Well, listen to that one again. But was she a hero in this story? Or is it possible, like Shannon's parents believe to this day, that she tried to help Chris? Now, this whoopsie is critical because we know at this time, Dr. Phil was in fact talking to Shannon Watts' family. And we also know that it's believed, based on what was said by the family and those around them, that at first they did believe that Nicole Kessinger had some responsibility and needed to be further investigated. And then all of a sudden their tune changed and no one really knows why. But this little soundbite here is proof positive that that was in fact the family's attitude at least at first. So now we need to back up a little. Let's go back to November 19th, 2018. That was the date of Chris Watts sentencing. This is District Attorney Rourke, the prosecutor for the charges against Chris Watts, speaking at the sentencing. The defendant then methodically and calmly loaded their bodies into his work truck, not in a hasty, hasty or disorganized way. 
He was seen from the neighbor's doorbell camera backing his truck into the driveway, going back and forth into the house and back out to the truck three different times. One time for each of their bodies. Now, here's the problem with what District Attorney Rourke says. He says that Chris took, and I'm so sorry that I have to even speak about this. I'm trying to be as respectful as possible. It's just horrible imagery. But he took the bodies of each of his family members, his pregnant wife, Bella and Celeste, from the house where he took, her, took their lives to his truck. District Attorney Rourke even goes on to offer details. You can see, he says, from Nate's security camera footage, that's the next door neighbor, Chris makes three trips back and forth, one time for each body. Well, I can't tell you how many times I've watched the security camera footage, and I assure you, he makes more than three trips. So that's just fabricated. But what's more than that is that District Attorney Rourke was wrong about the facts. He was wrong about what happened in the crime. Because you see, he did take Shanann's life at the house, and people have different opinions on this. This case is very controversial, but this is what I strongly believe based on the evidence. He took a very alive and aware Bella in the truck sitting over her mother's body. And the state that CC was in is highly debatable. If you want to know about that, please watch my video about what happened in the Watts basement. Again, the link is in the description box. But he did not and the girls' lives in the house. Now, how do we know this? We do not know this because of any evidence that was actually analyzed above and beyond Chris Watts' so-called confession, and I'm gonna get back to that. Take a listen to part of Chris Watts' first so-called confession. This is where he blamed Shanann for taking the lives of Bella and Celeste, and then he said he did the same to her in a rage. So we just started talking about, um, I asked him if there's any chance that the nanny cam could have recorded doing what she did. Um, and then we kind of, we were just getting into, you know, what Chris thinks about why she snapped. Mm -hmm. I know the audio is hard for some of you to hear. Um, the interviewer, Graham Coder, is saying, oh, we're just talking about, you know, if the nanny cam could have seen anything that happened and why Shanann snapped. So Chris is going to go on to talk about how the nanny cam caught everything going down, supposedly. Um, he's, he's just distressed from knowing about the other girl. Um, knowing that she didn't really know, right? I mean, in her heart, she, she, she knew. She just wanted me to admit it. <laughs> Looked at the monitor and it was on Bella. And where is the monitor? Where's the screen that you look at? Is it up or downstairs? It's upstairs. Oh, okay, so you go upstairs, look at the monitor. Yeah, the monitor. Up bed. Oh, you were master bed. Okay, yeah. all right. Up bed. So she's not in her bed. It's still right there. Okay, so you want to look at it. And then it was on Bella. Her covers were pulled back. She was just called out laying there. And then it cycled over. So they got three, four, five second like interval between when they when it cycles from room to room. And cycled over to Susie's room. That's when I saw her on top of her. That's when I ran in. Okay. We don't want anything to be um, incorrect or inaccurate or or anything like that. Um, was your wife on top of Cece? What, what did that look like? I mean, was she straddling her? Okay. And where were they? In the bed. On the bed. And so your wife was on top. Is it? I mean, was she? That's, that's when I was walking up in the back. Okay. And she saw in the back. Yeah. Okay. But she was doing this. It looked look like it was like this. Yeah. Okay. And then was Cece? Face up, face down, what? Off to the side. Oh, she was laying on her side. Okay. And that's when I pulled her off. Okay. She, 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 she was limp and she was blue. Okay. There's no movement at all. Oh. She was limp and blue or limping and blue? 
limp and blue. Limp and blue. Okay. It's like her body was like right. You pick her arm up and it turns into balls. Okay. Um, and then what happened? I looked at her and I just got on top of her and you went on top of Shanann did the same thing. Okay. Did you have to knock her down? No. She was already on the ground. I was like, I just pulled her off on the bed. Oh, kind of one move. Yeah. Up. Okay. So it's not as though you. No, I just pulled her off. No, like I went up, pulled her down. Okay. I did that. I, I didn't know. I lost it. Sure. Okay, so we can hear that it is clearly a horrible story that he is telling about what Shanann supposedly did. And I want you to note that the investigators are leading him all the way. They let him into this story. They're leading him into the details, including the camera, including the position and so many other things. I mean, this is an absolute horrible story. He looks at the nanny cam, he sees Bella, her blankets off her, she's sprawled out on her bed. He is implying that she is deceased. And then he sees the nanny cam that goes to Cece's room and Shanann is on top of her. And by the time he gets up there and pulls Shanann off of Cece, she is blue and limp. Horrible, horrible story. Make Shanann look horrible. God rest her soul. If we listen to Chris Watt's final confession, I think it is important to note that after this interrogation and the arrest of Chris Watts, which happened on August 15th, 2018. He, of course, was being held in custody and he did not talk to anybody regarding any details that happened this horrible night or in the early morning hours of August 13th, 2018. Eventually, on November 6th, 2018, and please, Keep that date in your mind, it's critical. Chris Watts struck a plea deal with the district attorney. Something to note that's important here, which I talked about in my bombshell part one and part two series, again, links in the description box, is that district attorney Rourke accepted Chris Watts' plea deal without any conditions, without requiring him to give any details of the crime and how it happened. This is important for several reasons. First of all, to avoid any issues on appeal to, you know, so a defense attorney connects with Chris, later comes back and say there was some issue and all of a sudden, you know, it's not a plea deal that's putting him in prison for the rest of his life where I believe he belongs. And also because it is only when the investigator and the district attorney know the details, can they complete the investigation in a way that corroborates the details of the confession, because as we all know, false confessions are prevalent. But that never happened. District Attorney Rourke did not hold Chris's feet to the fire. He did not require him to plea under any conditions. He just took the plea deal. On November 6th, 2018. So we heard what he said in the sentence hearing on November, on November 19th. So now let's fast forward in time a little bit to 2019, the early months of 2019. It's now February 18th, 2019, almost three months to the day of the sentencing hearing. As you might know, Tammy Lee, Graham Coder here, and also Dave Baumhover of the Frederick Police Department go to visit Chris Watts at Dodge Correctional Facility. And here is a very short excerpt but a very important excerpt of their interview with him. This excerpt picks up at the point where they are talking about what Chris apparently did to Shanann in the house, saying Bella walked into the bedroom and then she, he took Shanann outside to the truck. Back my truck up. At that point, were the girls still there? Okay. So then Shanann's in the truck. Then he went back to the house. We got her to buy out in the truck. Let's bail it first. It was CC first. And the truck? Yeah, uh, I'm sorry. So Shanann was first. And then Bella was next. Was Bella alive when you, put it, when you guys got in the truck? Oh, okay. What happened? I went back up. Okay. 
And so it is, I don't really want to talk, but it's not this part, honestly. Okay. Those are my kids. It's just about baby. I'm just talking about it at night. Help us be able to Okay. Every time I see pictures, I don't know how it seems. And being a dad was the best part of my life. So I took it all away. I think that's the hardest part for us, Chris, is we see those videos. We see that love that you had for your girls. Like, Now you can hear the surprise in Graham Coder's voice. You know, he's saying, okay, so Shanann was, he put Shanann in the truck and then it was Bella first. So the girls were there and then, you know, he kind of pauses, was Bella alive? Because, you know, until this point, they had thought that what happened was something like District Attorney Rourke's version of the events, which he scripted himself, that all of the lives were taken in the house and then transported to Survey 319 and Chris Watts' work truck in the, that state. Now, the really troublesome thing is, and I've talked about this before, and again, I've made a whole video about this, and it's in the description box if you want to watch it in length. The sad part about this is District Attorney Work did not need to fabricate a story. And this gets so much deeper, I promise. Just stay with me. Investigators in the DA's office had everything that they needed to have an understanding of who was in the work truck, if they were alive or deceased, and if there may have been somebody else in the work truck that morning. To this day, we don't know the answer to any of those questions. As investigators collected trace lifts from the back seat of Chris Watts' work truck, the center console, the driver, I'm sorry, the steering wheel, and the driver's side cover, and on September 4th, 2018, well, just take a listen to this directly from the discovery. It should be noted that on September 4th, 2018, while running through the evidence submission list with lab tech Patricia Lopez, several items were listed that CBI lab ultimately did not wish to take possession of at that time. Those items are crossed out on the evidence submission form, which has been added to the case file. The refused items are as follows. I'm going to read the last three items. Driver's side seat cover from work truck. Trace lift from center console of Chris Watts work truck. And trace lift from back seat driver's side of Chris Watts work truck. The items that were not taken by CBI are transported back to the Frederick Police Department and checked into evidence. Nothing further. So important, right? This tragedy happened on August 13th, September 4th, such a short time after. Chris Watts hadn't said moo about what happened. He certainly had not given a real confession and he did not tell any details to anyone. And again, District Attorney Work did not force him to, so to speak, by putting conditions on his plea. On September 4th, the Colorado Bureau of Investigations refused to analyze that evidence that was collected in Chris Watts' work truck, which is absolutely shocking. And I know some of you have heard me talk about this before, so I will leave it at that for now. It is disgraceful, egregious, and shocking. And now the family or law enforcement or, you know, have any position of power or assists. So many questions remain. Did Chris's mistress, Nicole, know more about his marital situation than she had let on? Did she have any idea that Chris would soon end the lives of the people who loved him the most? And although at some point, that question, questioning Nicole Kessinger's involvement, became reserved for conspiracists. But at some time before that all changed, a lot of people were asking those big questions, 
including Shanann's family, according to Dr. Phil. I do just want to add here that I say this all very respectfully. This channel has a lot of love, compassion, and care for Shanann's family, but we are just trying to bring out the facts of this case because I believe that complete justice for Shanann, baby Nico, Bella, and Celeste has not yet been reached. Now, Chris and Nicole met at work and sparks flew. They soon began an affair, but according to Nicole, she was not aware that this was an affair or that she was the mistress, that she was the other woman. She says she thought she was dating a guy who was in the midst of a mostly amicable divorce. Now, we know that Nicole Kessinger knew that she was the mistress for a number of reasons. I'm just going to point out two. One was at a time that was close to the time of this tragedy, and one was in the very beginning of their relationship. So on August 8th, the day after the Watts family returned home in Colorado from their trip in North Carolina, a lot of things happened. The ultrasound was that evening. Shanann was very upset because Chris had told her that he didn't want to have the baby, but he did agree to go to the ultrasound. That was at 7 p.m. Chris Watts on that day deleted his Facebook account. On that day, Nikki Kessinger gave Chris a key to her apartment. According to the Geotab location information, we also know that Chris Watts went to Nicole Kessinger's apartment right after work, and he stayed there right up until the time when he had to leave to go to the ultrasound with Shanann. What else happened on August 8th? Nicole Kessinger, well, let me read what it says in the discovery here. At 7.25 p.m., that's shortly after Chris Watts left Kessinger's house, Kessinger searched Google on topics related to marrying your mistress. Well, there you go. She knows she's the mistress. There's no question about it. That is on August 8th just five days before the annihilation of Chris Watts' family. Now, let's tie this all together here. Remember that day, June 12, 2018, the one day where emails between Watts and Kessinger were found, the day right after those consecutive days when Shanann posted on Facebook about her pregnancy? Nicole Kessinger writes to Chris, Agreed. It's always nice to find people you can relate to. I enjoy talking to you as well. I feel understood. I am looking for someone to build a beautiful life with. Seems so simple, yet so unrealistic sometimes. Build something similar to what you have done with your wife and those cute little girls. I do believe in karma, so out of respect for myself, you and your family, I think it is best if we keep that friendship at work. By the way, I will keep the conversations we have between us. Best regards, Nikki Kessinger. Well, 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 well. She's looking to build something with someone to have a beautiful life like he has with his wife Shanann and his beautiful little girls. Doesn't sound like a woman who believes that Chris Watts is separated and is on his way to divorce. Lies, lies, lies. And Dr. Phil knows. Once news of Shannon's disappearance spread, Nicole had gone to police of her own free will to speak to them about her involvement with Chris. But was she a hero in this story? Or is it possible, like Shannon's parents believe to this day, that she tried to help Chris? And when it all started coming unraveled, when it all started hitting the wall, she got scared and bailed. Was she actually helping him and got cold feet and decided, save yourself, girl? Very interesting, right? Now remember, that was from Dr. Phil's podcast, episode three of The Devil Beside Me, that was recorded and produced before Chris Watts' February 2019 jailhouse interview. So we have an idea of what people's beliefs were before his jailhouse interview and you know what was acceptable 
Dr. Phil was maybe even encouraged to say this. He certainly was allowed, but at some point he wasn't because again, this was the deleted episode. Now let's take a listen to Dr. Phil interviewing Shanann's family's attorneys and they discuss what was revealed during Chris Watts jailhouse interview and the impact that that had on everything. It shook the earth. In this Dr. Phil episode, we're about to explore a little bit. It was recorded right after Chris Watts' final confession to the three investigators when they went out to speak with him in Dodge Correctional Facility after he had already been charged, sentenced, and was no doubt spending the rest of his life in prison. Dr. Phil, in this clip, talks to Shanann's family's attorneys. He brings up the topic saying, we know that the other person in the investigation that was questioned was the mistress. Did anything actually come of that investigation in talking to the mistress? We will then hear what the attorneys had to say. And guys, it is very interesting. I don't know if you've ever heard this, but wow, wait until you hear this now. Chris Watts is sharing new details about the night he killed them. An attorney for Shanann's parents, Frank and Sandy Rusick, told our Dylan Thomas his clients were briefed on the new information and were evaluating their next steps. You need to pay attention to the fact that they say here that the family was evaluating their next steps. Dr. Phil asked the attorneys why investigators went to talk to Chris Watts in February of 2019. As we expressed, it's our guest that there was another person they were looking into or investigating that would have required enough time to either determine if charges should be brought or if that was not an avenue to be explored. And we're unsure at this point if that's ongoing investigation or not, so we don't want to go too far down that road. The Rusex family attorneys offer an explanation of why the Rusex may simply not care if law enforcement goes after someone else that may have been involved. I mean, think of Chris Watts' initial confession. He blamed Shanann for these atrocities. He blamed Shanann. And we heard earlier in this video just how horrible the story that came out from him initially was. It was absolutely horrible, heartbreaking. Shanann's family knew in their hearts there was no way that was true. And I'm sure it just added to the immense, insurmountable pain in their hearts, their minds, and their souls to know that that story was out there. And people might think that. They might think that of them. They might think that of Shanann. The Rusex family's main concern was to clear Shanann's name, and rightfully so. They probably felt after that happened, they could move on. The result of that interview in February 2019 from Dodge Correctional Facility is that Shanann's name was, in fact, cleared. The family attorneys say that with this confession, they hope that it can be known by all that Chris Watts did not walk in to find his daughter's lives being taken by the hands of Shanann. The attorney goes on to say, and man, I can totally understand this, and I so much feel for Sandy Rusick and the Rusick family, that the way the information is coming out now, rather than in a prolonged way, as it would in a trial when they had time to emotionally prepare for what they were going to hear, there's information coming out every two to three weeks, and it's making Sandy feel kind of angry, and my gosh, who could blame the woman? It's torture. The attorney then goes on to explain how the Rusics went about making the decision that they did regarding the outcome they feel okay with, with there being a trial or not being a trial, accepting Chris Watts' plea or not, and having death penalty on the table or not. And remember, the information that they were given from District Attorney Rourke upon which they made that decision was information that District Attorney Rourke himself was not even certain of because they never analyzed the evidence that was re found in the investigation. So the story that they based that decision on was that pregnant Shanann, Bella and Celeste's lies all ended in the home. And then Chris Watts loaded 
each of them, into the truck deceased, drove them to Survey 319, where he disposed of their bodies. But that is not what really happened. Personally, that the family made the choice, whether you believe it's the correct one or not, to not pursue the death penalty. If it were me, I don't know how that would sit with me, knowing that she didn't know the full story. And that might very well have changed the position she took, what she advocated for at the time. All I can tell you is what I might do. It would definitely have changed well, the Well, isn't that some me. egg in District Attorney Rourke's face? District Attorney Rourke relayed information to Shanann Watt's family based on an incomplete investigation, an investigation that he knew was incomplete, an investigation where evidence that was collected was not even analyzed. And based on that information, he asked Shanann Watt's family to make probably the biggest decision of their life so far. He stayed in their home for three days. After he found out, some information that I talked about in the part one of this series that Michael Prill indicated in his report in the discovery before the timeline that not all of the material was found in Chris Watts phone. In fact, he came across items from the secret calculator app, as he says, just as a result of curiosity. He says that the forensic lab didn't have whatever was needed to access those inner storage vaults of an iPhone. And now that he knows that there was a secret, secret calculator app, that there are places within that phone that might exist content that is relevant to the investigation, he, his plan was, as he outlined in the discovery report, to obtain another search warrant that would soon be executed and the investigation would continue on. <clears throat> the report was dated October 30th, 2018. Straight away, District Attorney Rourke and Steve Rand got on a plane to go to North Carolina to spend three days with the Rusick family. Upon their return on November 6, 2018, they struck a plea deal with Chris Watts. It is my opinion, and I think the facts that I've been laying out to you are that you may have already known on your own, indicate that District Attorney Rourke does not want anyone looking any further into this case. He did not want anyone looking any further into those phones. There are details there that he, for some reason, does not want uncovered. Stop asking about it. She didn't have anything to do with it. She wasn't there that morning. She voluntarily cooperated with law enforcement. She provided us all the information. I'm not going to tell you where she's at. Stop. Leave me alone. Could it be that District Attorney Rourke and the politics are the reason that that episode three of The Devil Beside Me of Dr. Phil's podcast, someone as powerful as Dr. Phil, could it be the district, district Attorney Rourke is the reason that that episode was deleted for some time? Was he trying to remove the words that Dr. Phil said from the history books? Please leave a comment and let us know what you think. Thank you so much for watching. We all want to know what you think, and I appreciate every single one of you. Justice for Shanann, Nico, Bella, and Celeste.